Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, so many accolades. I'm so excited that you're both here to talk with me. Um, first, I want to tell you all a little bit about this cookbook um, where Dana consulted with just a total who's who of chefs um, that would intimidate anybody else, but this is in her wheelhouse. And Thomas Keller, for example, wrote the foreword of the book. <laughs> so um, she starts off by saying, good cooking starts with honesty. So th around this statement, she has a deep, dark secret that inspired this book. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about your deep, dark secret and how you decided to bring this to light. So um, the dark secret was that after being at Food and Wine and talking about food all the time and being on Top Chef and you know um, knowing something when I knowing about food, I never told anyone that I actually didn't know how to cook the food. Like I could talk about it, but I couldn't actually cook it. So um, that that seemed like maybe I should fix that. You know, after 20 years at the at the magazine, and uh, and so this idea emerged that I could actually I could learn myself. But then I could share with other people, which was the book part. And um, because I feel like the really dumb mistakes that I make all the time, and I really do make them all the time, and even after having done the book, I still make them um, in new ways, though. Uh, that, you know, those mistakes that I make, other people make too. Mm -hmm. So if I could get the greatest talents in the world to tell me how to fix the mistakes, then I could spare an entire universe of humans from making the same mistakes. So I want to hear about the pseudonym that you used to have and what really sort of pushed you over the edge and brought you into the light as I think mistakes have, it seems like mistakes have been something that you've learned from all along, but you really wanted to go public with this. Right. I actually come from a long line of mistake makers um, and also a long line of non-cooks. So my my mother's the actually original mistake maker and original non-cook. Like she would, you know, walk into like, you know, a, um, I don't have them anymore, but she, she would like, you know, walk into an immo immobile object in the street and say, oh, excuse me, and you know, or like be looking for her glasses and never find them. In any case, they were on her, top of her head. So I am, um, at the magazine, it didn't seem like the wisest thing to share with people that I didn't know how to cook um, before I'd really established my reputation. So, Every weekend I would come home, I would cook at home, come to the magazine, and I would share with the test kitchen the mistakes that I'd made. And they would try to help me. And I decided it would be a good column for the magazine, which is what you're referring to. And so under a pseudonym, I did a column where I made the mistakes and our executive food editor corrected them. And then um, the nickname was Irma Rombauer. Um, because, of course, she is one of the greatest cooks of all time. So there's a little inside joke with me that I don't think anybody else really God, but I found it quite entertaining. And that was um, that was a good, solid 10 years ago. Um, but in the intervening 10 years, I became more confident, and I decided that chefs like Jonathan, if he found out that I didn't know how to cook, he would not think less of me. And the readers, I decided, you know, they liked the magazine enough that they found out the editor didn't know how to cook, they would not think less of the magazine. And so I came to the conclusion that it was OK to share. And more than that, I actually believe in a philosophy of um, talking about mistakes, because if you don't talk about them, you can't fix them. Mm -hmm. And if you don't fix them, then you're just sort of sent into a life of mistake making and not improving. So I thought philosophically mm -hmm. it was a good thing, as well as for like anyone I was feeding, it was a good thing. So nobody was surprised at the at these confessions. The magazine, no one at the magazine was surprised because they'd lived through every painful minute with me, um, mostly Monday mornings. Uh, but the world at large actually was quite surprised, and um, you know, I I took calls from lots and lots of people saying, "I don't believe you." And I was like, <laughs> "Read the book." No, no, I mean because I. Each of the head notes for the recipes is about the really stupid mistake that I made and then how I fixed it. So I failed in so many ways. And what was Jonathan's reaction when you approached him for his contrib contribution? I think Jonathan said, I'm, I'm sure you're better than you think, which is very nice. Were you just being nice? You know, um, I have an incredible respect. Listen, 20 years Dana's been editor of Food and Wine magazine. 
That's a huge accomplishment. And when she says, I couldn't cook, I think she's really being a little, you know, overly modest here. And I think that what, what she really is saying, that she wasn't an accomplished chef or cook. Mm -hmm. And that's what she's really talking about. And the whole thing about mistakes, I think, is the, is the key that binds everything together. Because I am the, the biggest believer in mistakes as a tool to get better. And you know, in our society, we, we have two ways of mistakes. We could beat the crap out of people, or we could encourage them. And you could go either road. And I think you know, when you encourage people, then magic happens. The other road is the road to nowhere. I will say that when Jonathan and I were cooking, we were in the studio together. And the first thing I did, like, I picked up the knife, and Jonathan was like, that's not how you pick up a knife. So, <laughs> um, so though he says I didn't make mistakes, like my very first action, she's like, that's not how you do it. And then we went to this. No, I didn't say you didn't make mistakes, but you weren't <laughs> an accomplished cook. I cooked a lot, let's say that. So I picked up the <laughs> knife, and he corrected me. And then he looked in this pan. We had we were making a, a gravy, and he came in like after a number of the things had been sautéed already. And this was a recipe that had already been tested in the in the kitchen at Food and Wine, and we felt very good about it. And Jonathan's like, "Do you have another set of all those ingredients? Because I think we could start again." And, and so and we did. It was fantastic. I mean, you made it so much better. Well, it's a little bit that Malcolm Gladwell thing about you do it, in my case, for 40 years, you do it the same, the same recipe, but you change it in so, in such a finite or infinitesimally small way, but you get to a different result. And a good day and a bad day. If it rains or it snows or the sun is out, the recipe is different. So Dana gave a compliment to you when she emailed me the other day, and she said that you're one of the best people she'd worked with as a professional chef, being able to teach these skills to a home cook. D was there a disconnect for you coming from the realm of just so much expertise and experience, trying to break it down to an elemental thing for a home cook? Was there a challenge there? I love the, um, the ability to, I, I've actually done a lot of teaching. In fact, um, I started first teaching Back at um, in 1979 with Wolfgang Puck, he had a, he was a chef at a restaurant called Ma Maison, a famous place in, in Beverly Hills, and and he started a cooking school called Ma Cuisine with Judy Gathers and um, the wonderful Judy Gathers, and they had invited me to be one of the uh, teachers, and and I had no clue how to do it, so I had Beverly Hills housewives with with giant rings on their fingers, and that was an amazing experience for me. It really was, <laughs> um, and in a lot of ways. It taught me more about myself than it, than I really taught other people because you, what you have to do is you know you know I didn't go to school to become a teacher but I had to learn on the job so I had to fake it mm -hmm. so I had to fake being no, uh, the knowledge that I could actually teach people what I did but teach them as a home cook versus a chef and and I think there's a, there's a big dichotomy here because people say cook and they say chef um, and there, there's a there's a big difference. There's a gigantic difference. In fact, uh, to be called a chef, especially in, in a place that uh, reveres chefs like France or someplace else, um, it's it's a whole different thing. To become a chef is really a hard road, and a cook is a different thing. And but I always think that I'd rather eat someone else's someone's home with a great home cooked meal than cook, than eat in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Always. 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 Because it's so much more comfortable, so much more relaxed. But it's only about the comfort. It's not about the food. What it's about every the food? and the food. And you know, I, there's nothing better. You know, every summer I go to France and we go, we we I go to this amazing place in France and the kids go to the garden and they grab stuff and they cook with me. That's the greatest thing in the world for me. Mm -hmm. I'd rather do that than anything. Even than cooking with me in a studio. That was a lot of fun, <laughs> Dana. Yeah, tell us about your process when you were there, sort of. You're on the spot, being called out for mistakes pretty much from the get-go. What was the process like, and how did you, um, how did you hone in on the high yum factor that you talk about? Well, um, the truth is, we we did start over. We did have a second set of ingredients so that we could begin the gravy again. And the phenomenal thing was that Jonathan showed me that within. I don't know, it probably took us, was it like a 15 minute gravy? Within 15 minutes, not starting with the stock, because with my, like, among my many mistakes, I can never get um, a chicken or a turkey to yield 
like enough juice to make a gravy. So I have to make a juiceless gravy, um, and that's what we were making together. But one of the reasons he's such a great chef, cook, teacher is that we started with these ingredients, and he just like very slowly and gently showed you know how to get flavor out of each one of these ingredients, um, and it was bacon, of course. Um, he also started, he, you started um, with olive oil in the pan. And I'm like, but there's bacon going into it. There's fat in the bacon. So these things that I felt like I had learned from chefs all along the way, like, why would you like start with fat if you're adding fat? He's like, don't worry. That's <laughs> really good. And then there, and it was finished with butter. So we had three fats, um, which of course is why it was so delicious. <laughs> um, so we just, we cooked side by side with, um, you know, I sort of poked at things and Jonathan really cooked. So you called him the Zen master of birds, and did, was there anything about that you learned aside from the recipe, any beside what's in the book about just his sort of mindset? Well, I think that um, one of the great things about Jonathan is that he takes the I'm sorry to say you take the easy way. <laughs> you know, like a lot of chefs when I cook side by side with them, they made whatever simple thing I was doing so much more complicated. Like I wanted to roast vegetables with April Bloomfield and I thought you know like you would chop the vegetables and you'd put them on a tray and you would roast them. But that's not what a chef does. Like a chef blanches them and then they saute them and then they, you know, and then they put them in the oven and then they like there's 10 steps and Jonathan was exactly the opposite. So he took the idea of the turkey where you know people have such so many thoughts about turkey and I loved he said um, you know like everyone from an expert to your son has said you need to brine the turkey and he's like no you don't. No, no, there's nothing. We're like it's salt and pepper here people and um, and I had an incredible problem turning this gigantic bird upside down. I tore the skin. It was just a, it was a mess. And I like had it sort of on a, um, <laughs> on this large implement so I could turn it over and it was sort of spinning. It was not a pretty sight. And Jonathan was like, why are you doing that? Like, you just leave the turkey sitting up. That was great. What would you say, like, what would you say the secret of your, um, and also never tent. He said, Tents are only for camping. Why would you tent your Why would you tent your bird? And every single thing that you like thought you knew, then he had some incredibly funny quip for. Well, you know, listen, I, uh, you know, you mentioned this whole thing about California, and you know, I was talking to somebody the other day. So when I, I I used to go horseback riding in Napa Valley, and the cowboys that we would that wrangle the horses with us used to cook, and they would take steaks and they'd put mustard and salt and throw them in the flames. And I was twelve years old. I go, what? What are you guys doing? And it was the most delicious thing that I've ever eaten in my life. So it really sort of stuck with me that sometimes simple is, or simpler, is always better. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's not always better, but it, it, it served me pretty well. You know, like, you know, and, and it's, not, it's not something that I think is for everybody. Some people like complicated. Some people like to do all that 25 in, steps to paradise kind of thing. <laughs> I think two steps to paradise. I don't want to, I'm a little impatient, I guess. And you know, like, especially like, everybody wants to know, I do this chicken at Barbudo that everybody wants to know how I do it, and they're all, they're always flabbergasts, and I say, it's, it's a good chicken, salt and pepper. <laughs> and they say, well, what else is there? What's the magic? And I said, uh, the oven? <laughs> and I said, and then, then of course, there is one tool that you need, which is a spoon. Tough. And, and you gotta baste the chicken. And they're just, no, come on, tell me, tell me the real story. You brine them, you, you, you talk them in, in you, you, you talk to them in, in Mandarin. What, I mean, what do you do? You like, you put, you inject them with soy, you put truffle. I said, no, you don't do anything. And I, I think that people just get so complicated. That chicken is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to mess with it? It's so gorgeous. It needs a little salt, it needs a little pepper, it needs some love, and it needs to get basted. <laughs> it's all about the basting. It's all, I mean, I think it really is all about the basting, though, right? And that takes some patience. So when Jonathan told me, I, like, for the turkey, I had to keep opening the oven and, like, basting this bird, I'm like, do I really? Like, that's sort of more than I want. It was I, so much easier than flipping that I bird think, over, I think you I know? actually'd rather flip it than baste, but um, <laughs> he insisted on basting. Well, there is something, Dana, that people have to really look into themselves. They, people are scared of ovens and the heat. We all are. We, because we don't want to 
kill ourselves. We don't want to die. You know, we get near <laughs> that we don't burn ourselves. We've all been burned by an oven, right? Everybody has. And we're all so once bitten, twice shy. And I think that's a, that's the fear factor as, as you become an accomplished cook is to learn to love your oven. Mm. Dana, you, did you learn to love your oven yet? <laughs> My <laughs> oven doesn't love me. I think it's really, um, and something that I learned from so many of the chefs, um, and particularly Thomas Carroll was talking about this, um, the, the temperature in your oven is probably not reflected in your dial, right? I mean, assuming that it's not an electric oven. So the, you actually never know what the real temperature of your oven is. And um, so the, you need to get an oven thermometer that's really reliable. So I have oven thermometers, but they're not reliable. And then the oven, you know, I have my back left part of the oven's very hot and the front right um, is it like 20 degree difference? And then if you open the oven door, um, I think he said, you know, you lose 20 degrees of heat when you've opened it and closed it. So, um, no, my oven does not love me, and I do not love it. I actually do mostly stovetop cooking. It's just <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's misunderstood. I, I assume, yeah. But also, I think people are afraid to saute. You know, one thing when I was in France, and I and somebody said to me, "Do you know what the word saute meant?" And I said, "Well, yeah, to, to fry something in a pan." They said. No, the word saute means to jump. And it was such a, like, a visually important cue for me to realize that sauteing was not what I thought it was. And so for young, young cooks and people at home, I always say that you have to learn the diff difference in pan cooking. And there's, there's many nuances of it. And those gradations from simmering to sauteing to braising, all those different things, are so important to what I call the lexicon of cooking. And it's, it's, it's difficult sometimes, but people are, again, afraid of flame. That's why electric stovetops have become so popular, because there's no flame. And I love electric stovetops. You take a sponge, you wipe them off, they're clean. <laughs> but they're also very difficult to gauge temperature. Mm -hmm. So to get precision, and I think um, Thomas Keller, who does owe me his life, that's another story. Um, that's you a know, really good one. Is you know, a, a great master of precision. And precision used to be, uh, started with pastry chefs. Pastry chefs cannot live unless they do it precisely. Like my pastry chef does things, it's six and seven eighths cup of flour. I said, why not just make it seven? She gives me that look like, you're an idiot. <laughs> that's because it's, that's what it is. And because she knows that extra scant one eighth of a cup makes the magic happen. So, you know, it's, I, so I think it's, it, you know, it's confidence of learning how to saute, learning how to not flip the turkey in the oven, and then learn the gradations of cooking. And those are the fun, those are the fun things. But is it about precision necessarily? Is it about? I'm the least precise cook that I know. Mm. That must be yeah. why I like you. And <laughs> um, I always, uh, you know, because, you know, I got in this business after being a musician. And, and when I was a musician, the most important thing in life was improvisation. And I think that the key to becoming a great cook or chef, whatever you want to call us, um, is learning how to improvise. But not improvise so that you're playing, you know, stairway to heaven as loud as you can. It's learning how to be subtle and beautiful and respect the ingredients. Mm -hmm. Can you tell and me more about the ingredients piece? Because I feel like when you're talking about the simplicity, the quality of the ingredients is just the key to all of that. Well, I think that um, most people think the food comes in a box. You go to the supermarket, and it's in a box in a plastic bag. I think with, thankfully, what Food & Wine's been doing lately, and other magazines, and other people in the food world are discovering the farmer. And the, and the farmer, and the fishermen, and the, uh, the people that produce what we do are, to me, the most important parts of the whole puzzle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love this thing about uh, McDonald's saying they're not going to use antibiotics in their antibiotic-laden chickens anymore within the next two years. I don't know, what to, how, why does it take them two years? Anyway. Um, <laughs> but, I don't um, want to know the answer you, to that. <laughs> we all know the answer to that. But um, I think that, you know, that if we respect the, those farmers and we revere them more, I think the world might change a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because I think the, you know, I always think I'm a custodian for what those people produce. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I grew up on a farm. I, I saw how that I hated being on the farm. It smelled, it was disgusting. I hated fertilizer. My grandmother used to make me polish eggs. Why do you polish an egg? 
Anyway. Um, Why do you polish an egg? It's a long story. Um, <laughs> Were you in trouble, Jonathan? I was always in trouble. But, <laughs> um, you know, when you get that, when you get that perfect, you go to the farmer's market and you see that perfect zucchini and it's, it's like an emerald. And that emerald needs to be taken care of and loved. And I always do the stupid thing. Dana laughs at me. I always think the vegetables talk to me. <laughs> okay, well, but she but said that Alice Waters was the vegetable whisperer. Yes. Yeah, well, she is. I mean, that, well, who did I learn from? You know? yeah. <laughs> Jonathan was right there. True. Um, although I have a totally new passion. Did you hear about this? No. No. Okay. So Jonathan just outlined, like at the farmer's market, the emerald zucchini. And I'm going to make a plea right here for the dinged, misshapen uh, zucchini. Because what's happened with the farmers, because not just people like Jonathan, but because America wants all of their vegetables to be straight and perfect and of a certain size and of a certain color, there's 20% food waste. Um, in just vegetables and produce in America. So these poor farmers that we revere, both of us, um, they toss it out because no one, they don't have the money to have it trucked away to someplace else. And they don't have the time and the equipment to turn that food into something else because you could make tomato sauce, you could make minestrone, there's things you could do. But if you have this gigantic farm. Um, so I'm now, I just launched this Saturday, um, Launching a campaign called um, Love Ugly Food. Like, yeah, Love Ugly Food. Um, and it's an amazing thing because if we can all embrace ugly food, we can actually help feed the world and re reduce the food waste. So I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm now, a, I mean, I love the emerald and it needs love, but the unloved ones, they need even more love and they're going to do even more for the world. It's revolutionary. It is. And I join a movement like, I, you know, it's like my eyes just popped open, but there's a lot of people who've been working on food waste and ugly vegetables for a really long time. So, you know, credit to them. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Bravo. <laughs> well, so, so speaking of this sort of revolutionary, um, on this revolutionary theme, I was really intrigued by your, um, you sort of talk about the personal transformation beyond cooking, beyond the kitchen that, that came out of creating this book. And, and I thought maybe, maybe that would be a good, um, a good thing to talk about to wrap up. Great. So um, I thought that I was going to go in the kitchen and learn to cook. And as it turns out, like my cooking is still somewhat problematic. But what I did learn, because I had to codify my mistakes, was that the thing that I really lacked was the ability to focus. And that indeed, if I could focus and be completely present in the kitchen and not be thinking about like, you know, something that I had to do for work or, you know, um, be looking at my email all the time or trying to do 10 things at once, I actually was a far better cook and I'd be a much better human being because, in fact, that lesson that you learn in the kitchen was just you have to be present, you have to show love, which is what you're talking about, um, and you have to focus. That's a much bigger life lesson. And um, yeah, there's you know sometimes I like my, maybe I don't hold a knife right, but the bigger thing was I ran out of the room to do something, and that's when the vegetables burned. Mm -hmm. um, and so so staying focused was a really um, important life skill, and and also honesty. So those two things of admitting that I was making mistakes and saying, I can get better at this, because I'd never really done that. Like, I made all the mistakes, and I ignored them. I fed a lot of people. No one was poisoned. People were happy. There were fun parties. Um, but I was never getting better. Mm -hmm. So the honesty leading to um, sort of my life improving, and then the focus, those two things. Wonderful. And did you come away with any big learnings? Well, I love the whole process, because you know the whole mistake thing, I think, led to what, what everybody's afraid of. Most home cooks cook the same thing all the time. It's the comfort zone. And um, I think part of my job is to get people out of their comfort zone. And when you become uncomfortable and you realize that you cook the same thing and people are kind of getting bored through those same, the same dish you made every time, that if you all of a sudden break open a, a, a cookbook and find something, I always say to people, don't look at the cookbook, go to the market first and shop, and then come back and find a recipe that matches what you bought. 
Um, but and then try something new. I think that is what we need as human beings to really develop, because change is inevitable. It can be good. It can be bad. It can be otherwise. But it is inevitable. And with cooking, I mean, when I started cooking, it was all about French, Chinese, and mm. Italian food. That was it. Mm. And now the whole world has come to come to our table. And I think that's the most amazing thing. So you can have a little bit of spices from India. You could have a technique from Portugal. You could have vegetables grown. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a brave new world. And I love that part of it. Mm -hmm. Actually, ha have, has anyone um, is anyone familiar with Dave Chang from the Momofuku Empire? He um, has a restaurant called Ko, which is a tasting menu. And last night, um, he did this agnolotti that was stuffed with a celery root puree. So the celery root puree, puree was very French, the agnolotti very Italian. And then he had um, a curry sauce. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was so brilliant. I would and never put those things together. He had a, a shavings of fresh celery mm -hmm. and then um, scraps of truffle and a foam. And I was like, oh my, this is the whole new world. The pasta was perfect and the spice like sort of knocked your head around. It is really, it's a very exciting time to be eating and cooking. That's wonderful. And I'm glad that lunchtime is almost here because <laughs> now we're all hungry. So I thought we should leave a little time for Q&A if people want to ask questions. We have two microphones on either side of the room, and I know that there are some foodies in here with some questions. How, would, how do you think celebrity has affected you as a chef in both negative and positive lights? What have been sort of the costs and benefits of, of encountering celebrity as a chef? Well, when I was in a theater on 14th Street with my son, I was uh, peeing at the urinal. And a guy taps me on the shoulder and I go, you're Jonathan Waxman. I, my son looks at me and go, with that horrific look on his face. <laughs> so that's the bad side of it. <laughs> you know, you know, the old, somebody was talking about that you know, because you're on TV and the TV is in everybody's room, you become part of the family, right? And I like that part, you know. And I always felt that I had responsibility to myself to show myself in the light who I hopefully was. But I had no clue who I was going to be on TV. That just happened. Um, and I think that's a crazy weird thing. But as far as the rest of the world, I think, you know, my industry needs great people. And if television can entice wonderful individuals to want to cook, that's a great thing. Um, but, you know, Bobby Flay worked for me for five years, right? I beat the crap out of him all the time. He, and he, he was humble the whole time. And look where he is now. So I think that Bobby's base was really being a cook. His celebrity as being a you know, celebrity chef is something different, but they're really connected. I was interested at the beginning to hear the both of you uh, have some background with uh, charitable works that are related to food. And since growing and preparing and distributing food is one of the most nurturing things that you can do, can you tell us a little about how you decided to give back and what you're doing and perhaps ways that we could contribute or find out more about what you work on? That's an awesome question. Um, one of the really great things about being involved in food is there's so many ways to give back. Um, I'm involved with in uh, City Harvest, and we have a Healthy Neighborhoods initiative that is um, extraordinary that you can take part in. You can go and help give vegetables or sell vegetables to those in need. Um, and there's, all, there's volunteer opportunities at City Harvest. And then um, at Hot Bread Kitchen, which is a training program, um, there aren't necessarily actions that you can take, like go make bread with these amazing immigrant, mostly women. But um, supporting their work is extraordinary because it helps change lives. So it's not only feeding people, but it's helped training them to have a better life. Hi, uh, 
Um, I just recently relocated from San Francisco to New York um, and had to downsize significantly. I live in West Village in a shoebox, essentially. <laughs> um, and you guys spoke about home cooks experimenting. That's something I would love to do as a, an avid cooker, but I don't really have the space to have a lot of tools to experiment with. So if I have like an oven and a drawer of storage, <laughs> what would you guys say are the essentials that every home cook should have in their kitchen if they are really limited on space so they can still experiment with food? I kind of love that question. Uh, uh, Mary Sue Milliken and Susan Finnegar had a restaurant in L.A. many years ago, I think 25, 30 years ago, and they had a hot plate and a toaster oven. In my, in my, and that was it. That was, that was it. <laughs> I don't know. I had an, a, um, a, one of the mag, you know, magnificent failures. I was cooking for my mentors, the people who'd given me my start in magazines. Um, so two really big editors, and I was making dinner for them, and I took really good care of the design of the table, and I had um, chalkboards, and I, and it was cute, but my stove wasn't working. Because I didn't plug it in, because I really liked style more than design, so it was like it was a '50s stove that I had taken out of a, a friend of mine's grandmother's apartment. It looked great. Anyway, so I had <laughs> I had a microwave, and I tried to microwave um, Poussin. And bad idea. That was bad, and so I ended up I had I also had two hot plates. And so I made pasta, <laughs> like just going on the fly. Anyway, but you're going to tell her she needs like a saute pan and she needs a chef's knife. You know, and I, you know the, the thing, thing is you need one pan to saute, you need one pot, you need a little paring knife, and you need an 8-inch or 10-inch chef's knife, and you need what we call a French fish spatula. Not that a will microplane. That will save your life. And I, loved, I do love microplanes, so I've... I've you know, shave my fingers so many times and those stupid things. Um, <laughs> but the most important thing is, and I really believe this, is that you actually have a refrigerator. Do you have a refrigerator? I have a refrigerator. And is it cold? It's very cold. Then you're, you're all set. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. A uh, question for Jonathan. Uh, you mentioned that you, when you're your famous chickens, that you baste, but there's a lot of other things that you don't do that are just unnecessary, like you don't tent, you don't brine and stuff. Did you determine all of that like experimentally over many years? Like, how would one know, in as far as other dishes go, that the basting is the thing to do, but the other ones are worthless? Well, I mean, I think I, unfortunately, I think there's going to be a dead chicken's head on my gravestone. <laughs> um, so I I, I I really feel sadly for all those chickens that I've you know cooked over the years, but I think that what what was the most important thing was I was talking to someone about, um, and this sounds a little weird, but subcutaneous fat. So what is that? It's the fat underneath the skin of the chicken. So when you go to the supermarket, some of the chickens look really pretty, but you got to check out how much, what their fat content is, and you look right around the bottom of the chicken. And if they have good fat content, and you see that beautiful fat kind of, then, but it's hard these days because they're in plastic bags, but if you go to a real butcher, they'll show it to you, not all chickens are, are equal. That's number one. Uh, number two is that, you know, because, you know, I've grilled them, I've roasted them, I've sauteed them, I've poached them. They're all great ways of doing it, but I found that, and this is kind of a little crazy, at Barbuda we grill them and then roast them. See? But the only reason we do that, because we don't have enough space to, to do them all in the oven. My restaurant at Dell's in, in Nashville, we just roast them. But I have this beautiful wood-burning oven. So, but it's really the basting. You know, I, I have a guy that's worked for me for 15 years, and he's the only one that gets, the, gets it perfectly. And I say, I want to do, I want to do a video and show, his name is Luis, he used to be a dishwasher for me, and now he's like a magician at the, at the grill. But when he does those chickens and you watch him baste, you just go, your mouth just drops open. Because you say, and he doesn't do it, he does it three times. Hmm. He bastes it three times, that's it. But were you asking him general, like, yeah, like, are you like, do you consider yourself an experimentalist in cooking? Like, in oh, experimentalist. Um, I'm a little bit more of, um, you know, I go back to the improvisation thing. I like, my, my wife and I have a routine. She goes to the farmer, farmer's market and she shops. She, I don't tell her what to buy. She just buys whatever she wants. Then she leaves the kitchen. <laughs> and then we have all the stuff out and then I make a mess and she won't let me clean up. And then we sit down and have family meal. And I love when I got everything around me and looking at stuff. And then you start thinking about how to do things. And I always, I make mistakes all the time. 
Like I'll roast something off and I'll taste it and I said, this is terrible. And then I had to figure out either how to fix it or you know where it goes. And that's where, the, I, I, you know, and you have to have the ego to, to tell yourself this isn't good. You know, I remember when Alice Waters went up to me and she said, honey, did, did you actually taste that? I said, yeah, I did, Alice. She goes, did you taste it every time? Uh, no. And she goes, that's your job. So it's really tasting, and I think, anyway, a long answer to, to your question is that, yeah, I, I think I do improvise, but I don't think I go out of the box like David, David Chang does. Thanks. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I had a question for you, um, I, I think John, to you both. Jonathan, you raised a great point, like home cooks tend to get into ruts, like we don't experiment, I definitely do that. Um, but one thing my husband and I have been doing is we've been using Blue Apron, the oh. kind of meal delivery, ingredient delivery kind of service, and there's been a definitely a rise in the number of those services. And I wondered, what's your perspective on them? You know, as a magazine editor, and it's all about providing people with recipes, and, and a chef. You know, what um, do you think it's cutting corners too much, or um, are you all about kind of getting people cooking any way that we can? I think um, Blue Apron is a really, really great idea. And uh, because indeed you get the ingredients, you get the recipe, and you can cook. You know, uh, I think yes. So to your, um, I'd rather have people cooking than getting takeout. And I think what would happen is after enough Blue Apron, you're like, actually, I don't need them. I'm going to go get a few of these ingredients myself. I feel emboldened. I feel empowered, and I feel joy when I cook, as opposed to fear or anxiety or bored. Um, so I think that you can get so many ideas, and then you'll take it on yourself. <laughs> and then if you don't take it that far and you're just doing blue for the rest of your life, that's really great, too. I think it's good. I think it's a good stepping stone. Because I think what, what you'll find is that at one point you go, this stuff's good, but you know, if I did it myself, I would do a better job. And I think that's the process that happens. Because at one point you will be dissatisfied with what you're getting. Right. It's good enough for a while. But you know you you'd rather go and pick out your own little string beans, the the the, the crazy ones and the, the not the so bend. the gra the and bent the ones and not so crazy and ones hit by hail yeah. But I think shopping is a joy. We all love to shop, and I think going to going to any 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 food place and taking the time it changes your life, it gets you out of all your all your craziness at work. You go into whether it's Whole Foods or the little bodega on the corner, you, your, your mood changes. You have fun when you shop. And I think, sh you know, whether you're shopping for shoes or food, it, it's a way to really change our lives a little bit. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, by the way, I've cooked from Dana's cookbook. Everyone needs to try the Nutella bread pudding. It's a <laughs> revelation and quite easy. It involves ice cream. Um, but I have a question. You mentioned before that, you know, you had two sets so you could start all over again. And in a lot of instances, we buy just enough for the recipe. And inevitably, I've actually cooked from your cookbook, so I have made many mistakes, like burning pine nuts, and <laughs> I've made—I didn't know how to um, quarter something. There were a lot of Google. There was a lot of googling. Um, so, what do you do when you've made a mistake? Can you fix it? And the recipe is not going to tell you you've made it because you can't anticipate it. How often do you fix it, and how often do you just? Start all well. I can't start all over again, right? I've bought enough ingredients from Fresh Direct to get this one recipe done. What do you do to fix versus start over? I mean, I mean, it depends how bad the fail was. Those pine nuts, you could just leave them out. <laughs> um, so I think some of that you have to do on on the fly. And as I said, for my lifetime of making mistakes and cooking and feeding people, because I really I only cook for eight or <laughs> eight or more. Um, so. Most of the time, people don't notice the mistakes. You know, if you left out the pine nuts, nobody's going to notice. If you like burned a corner of the chicken, no one's going to notice. And and it's okay. I mean, I think that that was one of the things that the chef said said to me. You know, I might be a little oversensitive. Um, and then some things are beyond redemption. You know, and then then there's pasta. There's pasta. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's one other thing to think about too is that if you're if you have your friends come and taste for you because you get too nervous, mm -hmm. you're, you think you've failed. And you, you probably haven't. You probably just made some silly mistakes that are easily rectified. 
And remember, you know, putting everything in one pot works all the time. That's so. You know, it is. It you know what? Leftovers are the greatest thing in the world because you throw everything in the same pot. You you put it in a low oven, and you and you go have a glass of wine, and come back, and it's perfect. I like that switch. <laughs> Hello. Um, I recently read an article about um, that uh, the food labeling that indicates the origin of the of where the meat or you know, uh, fish came from is being fought tooth and nail by uh, basically lobbying groups that represent packagers and all of these things. Unfortunately, you know, you can we can go to the farm every time. I try to go to the fishman, but sometimes I do have to buy at the supermarket. And personally, I do want to know where you know this produce came from. Uh, what's your opinion on this, and you know, do you think that the food should be clearly labeled with the origin, or you know, things like that? I think food. I think the food should be labeled um, where it's from and what is in it, so we're not surprised. Yes. You know, I had this thing where I I do some mentoring of of, uh, of elementary schools in New York, and you know, I went in and saw what they're feeding my children. Mm. <laughs> and I looked at the box, and on the bottom of the box, it was said you know, made in China. And I said, like, this is really bad. This is not good. But at least I knew where it came from. Right. <laughs> so I think labeling is important. Yeah. Um, you mentioned simplicity in cooking, and I like simplicity in cooking too. So what's your favorite food or recipe with the least amount of in ingredients where, you know, taking any of those ingredients away would completely change the dish? Well, I do this pasta dish, and uh, it's 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 the dumbest thing in the world, but it's people's favorite thing to eat. Um, it's spaghetti, but good spaghetti that you spend a lot of money on. Butter, a tiny bit of cream, and Parmesan cheese, and that's mm -hmm. it. And there's nothing better than it. And if you took one of the ingredients away, it wouldn't be the same. <laughs> but it's really about the technique in cooking. You got to cook the pasta perfectly, and if you overcook it, it's not so bad because you just bake it. <laughs> but you take the pasta and you toss it with the butter and the cream and the Parmesan cheese and you put it down. And, and if somebody were blindfolded, they, that's all they want to eat the rest of their life. Mm. Yeah, I actually, I just made um, lamb chops that you, you pound to, so that they're thin. Salt, pepper, hot, hot grill, two minutes, two minutes. It's three ingredients and it's, a ridiculous revelation you can't believe just the pounding of it and then and then that high heat and so it's crusty and then it's a perfect texture and it's a little salty and you're done it's good hey <clears throat> thanks for coming guys um so you guys talked about david chang for a minute before and you know, I, I love going to a david chang restaurant it's a great experience you get to taste things you never get to taste before and yet as a someone that loves cooking, I inevitably prefer going to Barbudo because it inspires me to do something that I feel like I can do at home because it seems more simple, I guess, to use a word that you guys have used before. Dana, as an author, as a magazine editor, what's your opinion on, on that in terms of how you're talking to your readers? Right. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about what the threshold is for our readers. What is... Um, simple but interesting, right? Because we never want to do something that is so simple that it doesn't teach you something new. Right. Um, but the amazing thing is that both from the Dave Chang side and the Jonathan Waxman side, you can learn something. So Dave, for example, um, he in, in my book we did kimchi pickles, which are super simple. It's like a gateway to Dave, but it's not the full-on Dave. <laughs> And, um, you know, with Jonathan, the ingredients are simple, the technique is simple, and, um, but you learn something because you learn about basting, you know, like, as someone was saying, that, that's the thing that, that turns us. So we're always trying to give the reader something that they will want to do, never the, um, to do recipes that are way too complicated. If something is going to be very complicated, um, we'll show a picture that's inspiring, and then we'll maybe pull out one part of it, like a sauce or a garnish or something that you can do so you can sort of get that sense of a chef's identity on your plate, but then you serve it with a roast chicken. Remember, the journey hasn't been that long for Americans in, in food. Mm -hmm. 
we're really on it's it's really new a new journey for everybody. When I started four years ago, no one talked about food. We already talked about other things, um, and I think the journey is just really kind of beginning. So I think David, on the evolutionary uh, track of of what you know you could do at home, you just keep keep at it. At one point, you go, I get it. That's not that hard. And it really, it's a little bit like, you know, you want to go work on your car and go try to fix your car, right? I did that once, and that was a complete disaster. But I'd like to go back and, and figure out how to do it. And it's, I think it's the same thing. you got to start simple, and you work, work your way up the, up the food I, chain. I don't think it's the same thing, but I get your point. <laughs> <laughs> but also someone like Dave, you know, Dave um, has, he's works all along the continuum, all the way from something super, super simple. He has... A, a concept that he's working on that's like between two buns, and then he has co. Which so I mean I think a lot of chefs work along the continuum, and you can tap into their thinking anywhere along the continuum, not just at the really complicated end. Quickly on that question around David Chang and the evolution of food, I'm curious to hear your opinions as to you know what you think are the most interesting trends in food today, and who's sort of leading that revolution and leading those changes. Well, since my obsession at the moment is, um, and it will be ongoing, it's, it won't be fleeting, um, food and food waste. Dan Barber um, from Blue Hill Stone Barns, if you know him, and he also has Blue Hill in Manhattan. This month, he's doing a pop-up called Waste Ed, um, which is wasted, but it's about um, <laughs> uh, educating uh, people about food waste, and I think chefs all around the country and all around the world are tackling this idea. So Dave, so Dan um, has chefs coming literally from all over the world to cook with ingredients that we would have thrown out. And I think that there's a very interesting movement with the chefs taking on these really big topics. Um, at the same time, as I'm sure you all know, the notion of vegans gone from like ew to ah, and um, that's been a beautiful thing to watch as um, so many chefs experiment and come up with dishes that are really delicious that use whole foods. Whole grains is a gigantic trend. So it used to be that like you thought if you were eating whole wheat you were doing a good thing. And now Marco Canora has a fantastic new book on um, whole grains and co whole grain cooking, which I think is a you know partly in response to the gluten free movement. But um, so I think there's a lot of interest if you bucketed it together in experimenting with new ways to eat for health where the flavor's delicious fermentation there's also i mean Jonathan's a great old hippie the like everything that the hippies did like it's totally new again I actually wasn't hippie but that's okay are you um, sure yeah i'm sure okay. uh, so and, and there, but continuing i think it's so important what what Danny just said that um, i think that doctors were completely oblivious to what nutrition was about. And now doctors are waking up to what can cure us and and how food can really, you know, really replace the drugs that they shove down our throats. Because the drugs we take are just panaceas, I think, and, and they're they're just they're just there to placate us. And this whole thing about Alzheimer's, you know, that you know that you know, people, why is there so much Alzheimer's happening? Why is there so much, uh, you know, gluten allergies? Why, why is all this, it, it's just, it, it's just, you know, expanding exponentially. And I think what, what doctors really need to understand is that food as a core subject, like you look at different cultures and cultures that are healthy versus cultures that are not healthy, and what do they eat? And, and how do they, what are their diets like? You know, who knew that kale and collard greens are the best thing you could possibly eat in your life? But, and, we, and then we said, well, you're not supposed to eat fat because of all the you know, cholesterol and everything else. Well, you know, your brain is 75% fat. So like, oh, maybe there's a correlation between you know, what our brain is made of and what we eat, and, and, and down doctors are waking up to that fact. And the more research they do, and the more correlation, the more they talk about this stuff, and they figure out that you know, the, what we cooked at home from the field and how we cooked it, and, and, we, and we didn't use GMO products. We just had basic stuff from the farm, and we cooked it well, and we lived healthy lives. Maybe there's something to all that. And I think that really is the most fascinating thing for me. 
My question is, how do you pick up a knife? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there, that's a really funny thing. Um, it's, I was a trombone player, and how do you pick up a trombone? There's a wrong way and a right way. Um, it, it goes back to, like, if, if I gave a knife to Dana, how do I hand it to her? Do I stick the knife towards her? That's bad. <laughs> How much do you like her? Do I turn the <laughs> knife around and hand her the handle? I'm, I'm going to hold the handle. There's a prop way to do that. And we learned it in school. So you put your three fingers under the bottom of the, of the, of the handle. You take your thumb right. There's a bolster that's on the, every blade. Put your thumb on one side of the bolster and your index finger on the other side of the bolster. And you turn. And, here you go, hand. Here you go, Dana. There you go. And she grabs it the same way. And that's how you hold the knife. Thank you. Should we say this is our last question? Okay. Oh, awesome. Hi. Thanks for coming. Um, I have two quick ones, hopefully. Maybe they're related. So one is around portion control. And I'm wondering um, if you have any quick tips or advice for when you have guests <coughs> over and when you're serving, and also just when you're eating yourself. Like, do you eat certain things first so that you get um, more full in the beginning? Or what looks good on portions and plates? Or I'm just curious about that. And then lastly, um, Secondly, is that I tend to travel a lot for work, and I'm curious, um, we're really privileged to be in New York and other areas uh, that I tend to travel to that are very, very foodie towns, and I can benefit from that when I'm traveling, but some places I go um, are not. <laughs> Most of the country is not. Um, and so do you have recommendations for folks who are on the road and all you get is like the room service in the hotel, which is, um, or around the town, which is like really far from optimal and ideal? I, I was talking to Phil Lesh from the Grateful Dead last last year, and his wife used to bring a saute pan and <laughs> and go to the market and make scrambled eggs from it at two o'clock in the morning because he couldn't find a place to eat. So I I know you're I know you're in trouble. Yeah. But you got Google, <laughs> and I'm sorry, but it's the greatest thing in the world, the greatest tool. Like if I'm in a foreign city. And I, I, I don't want to have room service because I know it's going to burn one half of the, of, the, of the club sandwich and the other part's going to be cold. And, and uh, you know, I don't want to have that at 2 o'clock in the morning. So I just Google where I'm at. And all these rating things now, if you, if you look at them all and then you use your, your power of, of, of intuition, you go, that place looks really cool. Yeah. Or you do barbecue. I want to eat barbecue tonight. And I think the world's really changed in that respect. And, and, and you got to be willing to take the risk. And it could be bad. But, you know, but why not? Why not try it? And I think, I think that's we're getting more bold with our choices of, of, of places to eat. I have um, a fear, which is a ridiculous, unfounded fear, of being in a place and not having food that I want to eat. And so my bag, like today I have an apple even though I'm coming here <laughs> and like there's nothing but food in this entire building from what I can tell. <laughs> and it's free. <laughs> but I had to have an apple and I had to have like a healthy granola rather than like an overly sweetened granola. So I, I pack. I mean I actually, you know, I, I went to Asia and I brought food with me. I just, I like having some control and I don't want to be starving and then eat something disgusting, yeah. which is um, the greatest thing I like to avoid. And so um, sometimes I'll go in, into a market and buy like like healthy whole foods that would make me happy through a day, which would be you know dried fruits, um, nuts, things that are filling and sustaining sort of good for your good for your brain. And then um, I tend in situations that you're in to go for something that I know, um, is real, so usually you can get an egg, and I feel like an egg is usually real. Like except sometimes they come in the what are those things like egg replacements? You know they come in big vats, like pre-scrambled eggs. Anyway, you wouldn't know, <laughs> you wouldn't know. But um, but like a fried egg in the morning, it's it's very reliable. And then I try to stay away from the things that are um, going to be very empty calories because it's just going to make me feel bad. So I try to stay away from the pastas and the breads and the bagels, which are all very readily available, but they're not going to make me feel right. very good. Portion control. Um, I also have a little paranoia around portion portions because I always make, when I entertain, I do um, like eight different bowls of things, all room temperature, so that if I've, I have to prep them early in the day so that if I make a mistake, I can fix it. But, you know, one thing's is grains, one that's a leafy vegetable, one that's a roasted vegetable, one that's... So I always 
allow people to choose um, the food for themselves uh, because that way they can figure out how much they want to take. And I always make way too much. But then there's leftovers, and I'm good with that. You know, it's funny. I, I, I was very privileged to know Danny Kay when I was at, at Michael's restaurant. And he invited me to his house, and he was a famous um, cook. And he just loved life. And I walked to his house. He says, Jonathan, it's all about the preparation. And he showed me in front of his walk, because he cooked lots of um, Asian food, all these little bowls of perfectly portioned out. He never portioned them. He had you know, five <laughs> people in the back doing all that <laughs> shipping and chopping. But it was such a revelation to see everything ready to go. And you relax. And you can cook. So if you can do those things in advance, and you can do it a day in advance or two days in advance, nothing goes really that bad, trust me, mm -hmm. especially if the refrigerator is cold. <laughs> and um, 39 degrees, by the way. Um, and if you have, you gotta be 39 degrees, that's a whole other subject. Anyway, um, uh, if you have all those things portioned out and you start cooking, you can have the glass of wine and have fun. <laughs> Seems like a recurring theme. <laughs> is it the glass of wine or the fun? <laughs> the food, I guess, also is a topic. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Great. Well, that was a great round of questions. Thank you both for your insights. And I want everybody to join me in thanking Dana Cowan and Jonathan Waxman for joining us at Google today. <laughs> <laughs>